was the word brokenness. <clears throat> and Linda found it <laughs> in that yeah. song, the very first one. Ah. Uh, Yes, absolutely. And, and it's a reminder that Christianity is not a religion. Well, it, it's not a religion. It's a relationship. It's a relationship that we take with us every single day, every minute, every hour. And it's not a set of do goods, don't do this. It's not self-righteousness. It's none of that. It is all that word, brokenness. Brokenness. I mean, that's where we meet the Lord when we realize our confidence in ourself will not sustain us. That we think we are good enough and that we face a holy, perfect God and through our guilt and shame are broken. I, I love that in that song. That war between guilt and grace. Grace wins. <laughs> when we come to that place of brokenness before the Lord of saying, I can't do this. I cannot fill in the blank. Whatever it is, this week, I cannot do this. And the Lord floods in. And he says, oh yeah, you can. You can't do it on your own. You can't do it on your own. And so it's brokenness. It's being reminded again of the Lord's grace, of Jesus stooping down and picking us up and telling us to guard ourselves. Guard ourselves. Continue to pray. In the garden, he taught to the disciples three different times, came back to them and said, Wake up! and pray. Wake up and pray. This has been haunting me all week. Pray, pray, pray. The greatest thing we can do is to be prayed up because so far, <laughs> my life, I'm all about winging it. I'm a wing it type of guy. I am. In sales, in anything I do, I mean, if there's a project to do, I jump into it. I'm going to assess things as I go and deal with it and do the best I can. And God said, no, no, no. I, I, you need to know your weakness up front. You need to know you can't do this properly. And, and if you're not connected to me, it's worthless. Even though, though you think you have a success in this world of doing something good and great, if God is not connected to it, it's worthless. Right? And so, we have a life illustration now given to us in Peter's denials of overconfidence. Peter was all about, I'm going to stand, Lord. To the very end, to the death, I will stand. And Jesus is telling them all along, you can't. You won't. There's no way possible that you will. But Jesus says, look, you're going to be sifted. You're going to be taken to the lowest level. But I've been praying for you. I mean, Jesus is praying for us. He's... he's He's, he's at the right hand of the Father, Father interceding for us, saying, look, look what, what's happening in their life. Give them the strength to carry this, carry them through. They are ours. They are mine. And he says to Peter, even though you go to these depths, you will recover. Do you remember that in Luke? He told them that. After Peter said, no, I, I, I will go to prison. I will even go to the death, Lord. I will not fall away. And Jesus said, after you've fallen away, you will recover. And after you have strengthened, 
the brothers. Strengthen those around you. Encourage them to not be overconfident and to pray. Right? And to stand firm in the Lord. So we get this life illustration here in Luke. And we see the worst failure. I, I tell you, I, I, I so connect with Peter in this. This is one of my favorite stories, events in the whole Christ picture because I, I, I connect with Peter in this of denying Christ, of, of being so, ah, I can do this. And then falling flat on my face. And, and, I, and to see Peter restored is just wonderful. Wonderful. And it's the best recovery. And so turn with me to Luke 22, where we're at. In verse 54, we're going to look at 54 through... Verse 54. <clears throat> then seizing him, this was in the garden of Gethsemane, um, they seized Christ, they led him away, and took him to, into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. And when some there had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat, sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, This man was with him. But he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, Certainly, this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. Peter replied, Man, I don't know what you're talking about. And just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. So what we have here is a compressed version of what Peter experienced in his temptations and his failings of denying Christ three times. It's, it's all compressed here. Where in the other Gospels, in Matthew chapter 26, Mark chapter 14, and John chapter 18, they give accounts of this same exact scenario, but give more details. So Luke gives us the condensed version. But what you find is this these three denials happen over a two-hour period where Peter is waiting while Jesus is undergoing, undergoing an illegal trial. We're, we're going to talk about the trials next week, which, wow, I didn't realize how unrighteous and unlawful these trials were according to Jewish law, number one. And we, we know he was railroaded through these, but these are all being done in the, in, the, in the darkness, which was not allowed in Jewish courts. They're supposed to be out in public, which there would be a public one, but 
it's all a sham because they've made up their minds, made their judgments, and condemned him during the night in these dark places of the high priest. And uh, so as we get more details on this from Matthew, Mark, and John, we find that after Jesus is put in chains and drug away, that's how we had left him last week after Judas betrayed him with a kiss. And they chained him up and took him away. In the meantime, the disciples, what happened to them? <laughs> right? Just as Zechariah said, strike the shepherd, the, the sheep scatter. And so they're, they're, they're fleeing in fear. And yet, Peter has run away, yet he circles back. And he comes back and he's present where Jesus is at. So we have to ask, why, why is Peter coming back? He, he's afraid. But I think there's a part of him that still is saying, I need to prove to the Lord I, I will stand with him. Really. He's going back there to try to get close to Jesus. Um, in his mind, he's still thinking, I'm... As long as I'm in Jesus' presence, I can do anything. That, that's what he's thinking. But Jesus is not present with him at this time. So they take him to the high priest's house. Um, if you remember, uh, the high priest during this time was Caiaphas. And he sh we, we've heard his name in the past. Uh, and his father-in-law is Annas, who was the high priest. Now his son-in-law is now the current high priest. And these two have a whole organized scam going on in the temple. They, they own all the temple businesses, right? And Jesus has already called them out on it of saying they are thieves. It's just a den of robbers. Remember that? So Caiaphas and, and Annas. <clears throat> he, Luke just talks about they, they took him to the house, high, house of the high priest. But in John, John goes into specifics and says they took him to Annas and Caiaphas. And Matthew and Mark talk about Caiaphas. So it's like, well, where did he go? Well, it's easily explained when you look into what happened because we know... Peter denied Christ these three times in the same area, in the same courtyard that night, in, the, in that two-hour span. So, <clears throat> the palace of Annas and Caiaphas, looking, looking down from, from Google Map we're doing here, looking down, zooming down, um, we got the street out front, and here is a gate that would, these, these are buildings here. And this would be a courtyard. Now, these two are related, uh, and, uh, Annas and Caiaphas are related, so they have an interconnecting house, palace, okay? One has one wing, the other has the other wing. So Annas is on this side, Caiaphas is on this side. Now there's a real thin corridor that goes leads back into this courtyard where um, we hear that Peter is going to go. And his denials will be intertwined with Christ's trials. And we're going to look at Christ's trials next week. But this is to emphasize the triumph of Christ that that Jesus will stand firm through all these trials even though he is beaten maligned spit upon mocked he stands firm because he knows his mission his mission is one of love for all of us and Peter's denial 
denials will intertwine with that because we find his first denial will be at the time that Jesus is taken into an upper room with Annas to be grilled. And then they can't come up with something to nail Jesus on, so they send him across the courtyard over to Caiaphas' place, to the upper room. So Peter, during this time here, denies Christ once, and then the other two will be while he's here. And then Christ will come out, and their eyes will meet. After the denial. So these two trials took place anywhere from 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock at night. So this is going to go all night long into the day. So these are three Jewish trials. It's trial 1, trial 2, and then a third trial in the morning, as soon as dawn breaks. Then they're going to go out and put on a performance and do a mock trial out there, a third one. Then he's going to go before the Gentiles. He's going to go before Pilate. He's going to go before Herod. And then back to Pilate uh, countless times. So it, it, this is a long night and day. And to Peter, it's a very long night and day. Just to remind you, I guess I already have, but earlier that night at the Lord's Supper, at the Passover meal, Jesus had told Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked for you to be sifted like wheat. Look, Satan's coming after you to shake you, to agitate you, and take you to the bottom. Okay? And Peter's response, in verse 33 of Luke 22, Jesus, Peter said, Look, with you, I'm ready to go to prison and death. And then Jesus said, I say to you, Peter, the cock will crow, or before the cock crows, you will deny that you did not know me. Now that wasn't the end of it. As they left the upper room, Matthew 26.30 as they were going to the Mount of Olives, Jesus told them, you will all fall away. So he's reminding them again, you're all going to fall away. And that's when he said to them, when the shepherd is struck, the sheep will scatter. And he told them, but you will all be regathered in Galilee. He's already told them, you're, you're going to be regathered. You're, you're going to flee, but you're all going to come back. But after Jesus says that, Peter speaks up. He says, I will never fall away. I will never fall away. Never. This is his second time of speaking forth. And Jesus again says, this very night, you will deny me. And then Mark 14, 31. This is the third time. Mark says that Peter speaks emphatically. I mean, he's, he, he's taking this as a personal insult from Jesus at this point. He's like, you have said I'm going to fall away. But I know myself better than you know me. <laughs> okay? That's what he's saying to Jesus. I know myself better than you. In Mark 14.30, Jesus responds and says, You're going to die, deny me before the cock crows twice. Now, I didn't realize this. But that's inserted in there. The cock's going to crow twice this night. It's not just once at the end. It's going to happen earlier as well. 
And you would think that would shake Peter's consciousness, but he's so overcome by fear. So, what we learn right away is that Peter boasted too much and prayed too little. He had three times the Lord told him to pray, to pray, to pray. Lesson for us, right? Boldness and confidence will crash. We need to have our confidence in the Lord speaking to Him, asking Him to brace us, to brace us, to, to hold us up. So, <clears throat> now we're going to see Peter's confidence just implode from within. Now it says a young girl here, a servant girl, was the one that would call out Peter. So Peter has been brought to a level of fear so much that the simple words from a young girl is going to scare him to death because he's afraid that word's going to spread. But that shows you how intense he is, the fear that has completely overcome him. And this is um, a portress, or uh, they call him a porter or portress. It is that person at the gate. Here. These gates were in these courtyards, or in, in access to these different places for protection, to keep people that wanted to kill. I'm sure there was people that wanted to kill the high priests. And this person here would run that gate. And here it's said that it's, it's a young woman. They would uh, shelter right there, have a quarters right next to the port, and open that gate. And it was her that saw Peter come in. Now... You have to ask yourself, now, they've got somebody at the gate letting people in. How did Peter get in there, right? How did he slip in there? Well, this is pretty amazing because John reveals that Peter couldn't get in. He had to have someone get him in. And it was, the way John puts it, he says, another disciple who was known by the high priest had got Peter in. John is talking about himself. For some reason, we don't know how, but he knows the high priest. And therefore, this young girl knows John, and John gets him in there. This is just kind of one of those things I've missed, never saw, but it was John who let him in. This makes me think even more about John. John. He's quiet in all this, right? John's kind of the silent watcher of all this. Peter's the one up front, talking. John seems to be everywhere, and yet is quiet, which is kind of funny because, do you remember his nickname? James and John? They were the sons of thunder. <laughs> right? This means these two were outgoing and spoke loudly. I guess they could not compete with Peter. But here John, John is present during this whole time and nothing's really said of him. He's, he fled as well. Okay, um, But he's the one that got Peter in there. John does that a lot. He always talks about another disciple or the one whom Jesus loved, kind of talking about someone else. He's talking about himself. And that, that's... I'd like to read that.
So we're getting the understanding that Peter is trapped somewhere between love and fear. He has a love for Christ. And he wants to be there. He wants to protect them and stand, and yet is fearful. And so he stays far away. He's finding a place. Um, remember in this in the story, it's, he's going into the courtyard. He's sitting around with the temple police, trying to stay in the shadows. But they get a fire going there in the courtyard, warming themselves. And so he comes up to warm himself. And out of nowhere, the servant girl says, this one was with Jesus. And John is the one who said it was the maid who led him in the door. So she's, she's in some way in her loyalty to her master owner, boss, the high priest, is saying, look, there's one of them. There's one of them. He was with Jesus. As she was staring at Peter intently, okay, she, she'd been looking at him for a long time and saying, okay, I know who he is now. This man was with Jesus. So he was exposed. And this, this right away kills his self-confidence. And Peter says, I do not know him. I don't know him. So this insignificant person here dropped him to the ground. His denial was immediate. And then others chimed in. And he was denying it all. Jesus was right. His flesh was weak. All his bravado is gone. He says, I don't know what you're talking about. I, I, I don't know that man. And after that, Mark, in chapter 14, 68, says that he went out into the porch. That means he went back into this corridor in the darkness. He didn't leave. He's still there. But he just made his way to kind of hide back there. Feeling guilty, pain. It had to be at that point this prophecy was true that Jesus had said. And so the second denial comes about as he's back in that corridor. Uh, Matthew says it's another maid. Uh, Mark says it's a servant girl. It could have been the same girl saying again and another girl saying, yeah, yeah. And then other people are jumping in as well. Many accusers. So he denies for a second time. When they said to him, this fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. They're saying it again. And Peter denied it with an oath. That's what Matthew says. He, 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 he is giving an oath, oath. This is like, I'm not just denying it now. I'm saying, look, I am telling you the truth, so help me God. So help me God. In, in other words, he's saying, look, God is going to reveal to you that I'm telling you the truth. This is taking it a step higher. But he doesn't leave at this point. He doesn't leave. He probably shuffles back through the crowd and ignoring them. And then the way Luke says, an hour later, verse 59, after an hour had passed, another man insisted Certainly, this man was with Jesus. He is a Galilean. Okay? They knew he was a Galilean. Galileans had a different dialect. Different, 
Different accent, right? You go to Alabama, they're going to sound a little bit different. You'd say they're from the South. Not exactly sure where, but they're from Alabama. That's what they're saying. This man is, is a Galilean. That's where Christ comes from. And actually, the man making this accusation, it's pointed out by John that this person was a relative of the high priest's servant, Malchus. Malchus was the one Peter, Peter removed his ear when that temple guard had tried to grab a hold of Jesus. Peter took his ear off and Jesus put it back on. And so this is a relative. He's like, he's one of them. It, it's that he, he's a Galilean. He's with Jesus. And Peter responds by saying, Man, I do not know what you are talking about. In Matthew 26, chapter 26, verse 74, it says, Peter began to curse and swear. So the first time he denied, second time he's making an oath, kind of a positive thing of, hey, God is my witness. I am telling the truth. And he's taking it even to a higher level now of saying, may God strike me down if I'm not telling the truth. May I be damned if I'm not telling the truth. This is him putting everything out there of lying in the extreme I mean, it's bad when somebody lies, but then to pull in the Lord as being a part of it, and then so help me God, if this isn't true, strike me now. So this is the same Peter. The same Peter, when Jesus asked him, who do you say I am? Peter spoke forth, he said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said, Yeah, that's right. You wouldn't know this unless the Father had revealed this to you. This is insight only you have from God. And now he's pronouncing curses on himself in the negative. So what started as a single lie to a servant girl has escalated into this huge lie. Right? That's, that's the way lies work, right? We all know from experience. You try to cover the one, it gets a little dirtier, cover it again, it gets dirtier until it's this huge ball of mess that just comes crashing down. So at that very moment, Verse 60, immediately while he was speaking, a cock crowed. This was the second time. The first one, whoop, I missed that. The first one was after the first denial when he ran into the cor corridor. He heard the cock crow. And yet he stayed there thinking, I'm, I, I don't know what's going through Peter's mind, but I'm taking it inside. I, I'm, I've got to show myself strong enough because I say, said all these things to Jesus. I've got to show myself. And so he thought he would stick around and then he denies them two more times and finally the cock crows right on schedule. This is God's story. This is God's history. God's timetable. All that the Lord had told him had come true. Peter had no strength. His confidence was gone. He boasted too much, prayed too little, acted too fast, and followed too far at a distance. And then the terrible words of verse 61, And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. 
So what's happening is Jesus has come out of this trial from Caiaphas' house, getting ready to be let out. Peter has just denied for the third time. The cock crows and Peter looks up and sees Jesus, who I'm sure, sure his face was marred, bloodied, and their eyes met. And I'm thinking the eyes of Jesus at this time. Jesus is thinking what I, what I, what I would say, think he would say is, I told you so, right? Okay? But Jesus looking at Peter, it's out of love. He's saying, look, Peter, I told you this. I'm sure that's what was being conveyed there. It was a sense of sadness, of disappointment. And yet, on Peter's end, his world has just been shattered. Shattered. I mean, to look into the eyes of Christ, let me, let me remind you what it's like to look into the eyes of Christ by reading Revelation 1. John, of course, writes this. He says, To the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from Him who is and was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before His throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of this earth. To Him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by His blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve His God and Father, to Him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, He is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see Him, even those who pierced Him, and all the peoples on earth will mourn because of Him. This is quite a picture here that everyone in the world, their eyes will meet Christ. When This is talking about when Christ returns. Every eye will see Him, even those who, who have pierced Him, those who have rejected Him, maligned Him, ignored Him, to ignore is reject. They're looking at the King of kings and Lord of lords. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, Write on a scroll what you see, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. So this is John. He's called to write this book of Revelation. And he's penning this to the seven churches. And then John says, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. Piercing, blazing fire of judgment. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace. In his voice, like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp, 
double-edged sword. This is talking about the Word of God, that He spoke the word, world into existence. The power of God coming out of Jesus' mouth. His face like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. <laughs> That's the response of being face to face with Christ in all his glory. This isn't the first time John had experienced that. He experienced it on the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus revealed who he was. Remember that? And there again, they all fell over. They all went into a coma. The three disciples, they, they passed out. Because the glory was too much. But then John says, Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Right therefore, what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place. Okay, so this is Jesus. That, that's exactly how he is. How we respond to Jesus falling before him, and Jesus reaches down, grabs him, pulls him up, says, do not be afraid. This is the same message that he's been telling to Peter. Look, you're going to fall down. You fell down when you met me on the boat. Remember that? Way back then. When he told Peter to cast his nets over the side, and Peter's like, ah, we've been fishing all day. We're not going to catch anything. Okay, I'll, I'll humor this man. Go ahead, throw him over. And they pulled in this huge catch, and then Peter looked at Jesus and realized who he was, the righteous one, the Messiah, the one sent from God. And Peter realized, I am a sinful man, and fell down before him, saying, Away from me, Lord, I cannot be in your presence. That brokenness there. Peter has that same brokenness now, as he's looking at Jesus. Of, ah, I've, I've, I've denied you, Lord. How can you ever accept me? And he flees. Shattered, broken. But I want to point this out. This is not another Judas. Judas was not one of them. When I think about the book of Luke and how I connect with the prostitute, with the leper, with the woman touching the hem of his garment, with Nicodemus coming to Jesus at night, a Pharisee, of all these people, it's like, Lord, that's me. That's me. That's me. I'm in need. I'm in need. And I fall down before you. And then you come to this person of Judas who is just like these Sadducees and Pharisees that hate Jesus. Cannot see who he is. Cannot see his love. Cannot see the compassion that God is revealing to the world. I, can't, I don't understand that. Judas... It's sad. I, I know what the disciples thought about Jesus. It's just sad. He walked with Jesus three years, and his heart was never open to Christ. He rejected Jesus and was so focused on greed himself. But Peter's not another Judas, not, nor any of the disciples. And that's great, great news for all of us. Anyone who knows Jesus has come close to him. We can't go far. Even though we may be off in the distance as Peter, we're still near to him. So I know that love for Christ broke his heart. He ran off and wept bitterly, repentant. That's the difference between him and Judas. Judas went off knowing what he had done, but had no change of heart. No change of heart. Here, Peter is breaking down because he understands it's not just 
his sin and being caught in the sin, right? What, what's worse than sinning? Getting caught, right? It's when you get caught, then it's like, <gasps> oh, yeah. Then you feel the shame of it. But when you're sinning, it's not as apparent. But here, Peter goes that Christian step of, Lord, I have sinned, but I've sinned against you. I've disappointed you. I've let you down. I've sinned against you. Does that make sense? And he, and he cries in sorrow, in regret. The greatest thing, it's not the end of the story. It's not the end of the story. Because when Jesus comes back, The disciples are gathered around and Jesus shows up and Peter is just ecstatic. We'll get to that as we go further in the story. I just love it. Where Jesus, or Jesus has died, has risen from the dead. Peter's back out fishing. They come in, cooking the fish on the shoreline. Jesus shows up in the distance says, you know, reveals himself to Peter. And Peter realizes who he is. He jumps in the water. He's so excited. I get to see my Lord once again and connect the eyes with him. And then Jesus comes to him alone and says to him, do you love me? After all Peter had gone through in denying him, now the Lord is asking, do I love him? And Peter says, yes, you know I love you. Jesus says, tend to my lambs. Take care of my sheep. And then Jesus asked him a second time, which had to have hurt Peter more. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. And feed my sheep. Give them the word about me. And then a third time, that had to just floor Peter at that point. Peter, do you love me? Peter says, I, I love you, Lord. Jesus said, be my sheep. And this, this, is, this is the Lord's forgiveness that comes to us daily. Again, we come to Him, confess our sin, looking Him straight in the eye and saying, yes, I agree with you, what I have done offends you. It's forgiven because of the cross, because of what you've done. And I claim that by faith. And Jesus said, I will restore you. I will, I will draw you near to me. And so through those three denials now, Jesus is saying, I'm giving you three times where I'm restoring you back to me. Beautiful story. And so Peter, it's not the end of the story. Peter's going to go on in the book of Acts during the day of Pentecost and preach the word. 3,000 people are going to come to Christ. He's going to preach again. 5,000 more are going to come to Christ. It's going to continue on in his ministry to where God uses him amazingly because he was broken, knew the depths of his need, not just in salvation for Jesus, but now to carry him through in speaking, in living, in proclaiming Christ. And he would take it to the extreme in his own life where tradition says they crucified Peter, right? Right? But Peter didn't, he said, I'm not worthy to be crucified like my Lord. And they crucified him upside down. So Peter tells us, he's telling me, take up your cross, deny yourself, right? Deny yourself, deny your self-confidence and put your trust in the Lord and follow Jesus.
follow him. Follow me. So what a message for the world that Christ has come, given his life. He doesn't make good people better. He makes dead people alive, right? Spiritually brings life to people, to each one of us, and gives them life. And then gives us life abundantly. That means beyond the day of salvation, each day we are living. We have to pray and connect with Him. Because we love Him. That's the whole point of the thing. Because we love Him. We love Him. Peter says, I love you. I'm, I'm a broken, broken, broken vessel. And I know what you've done for me. And I know what you'll do through me, through each one of us. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the means and the ways you've given us your word. That we can see in lives affected in the past who walked with Jesus and as John testifies that they saw you, they touched you, they walked with you and they beheld Jesus' glory. And now, Father, we who are here 2,000 years later, Father, we can say we know you. We know who you are, what you ask of us, and we know that Christ is the answer. Father, work in our hearts daily to pray, to pray, to pray. To find that closeness with you that there is nothing in this world like it. To know that you are living and breathing and guiding our life. And may we put our trust in you. Not this world. And may we reveal to this world who you are but it's not me. It's Him. Any good that comes from me is from Him. Father, I ask that you work through each one's lives to influence their world and to see you draw us toward your word and toward you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.